you animal lovers out, out there, you're not going to like what we're about to see, but this is the traditional Kyrgyz game that's kind of like polo with horses, except you don't use a ball. You use a headless sheep or goat. Just think back to the old days when it used to be a live sheep. The objective of the game is to grab the sheep's carcass, wrestle it from your friends, and then ride down and dump it in the goal at the other end of the field. The tactics of the game are quite simple. You've got to pick up the sheep and run to your goal at the other end of the ground, but there's quite a lot of tactics involved in the way you block the other player from actually throwing it into the goal or stop him from running, and the way your team's got to protect you from the other team when you're trying to get towards the goal. So it's not as simple as it first looks. Anyone for a swim? Lake Izikul here in the Kyrgyz Republic, Kyrgyzstan. This was a junction point on the Silk Road where people turned south to head to Kashgar in China. And they say there are three things that you must do in this lake. You must swim in it, you must eat its fish, and you must drink the local vodka. Well, one of three down. Two of three. <coughs> but look at the spectacular scenery here. It really is an astonishingly beautiful place. In the middle of Kyrgyzstan, on the Silk Road. Imagine for a moment being a road weary traveller, cresting a mountain, dust in the back of your throat, desperate for a wash, and you cross over this dusty road and look out upon a view like this, and how wonderful it must have been to tear off the clothes, to run into the shore and dive in, and to give yourself a wash in a slightly saline water, about one-seventh the salinity of the ocean. And Lake Izikul is known as the warm lake because its salinity plus its temperature, slightly warmer than normal and the thermal activity underneath keeping it that way, means that this lake never freezes. The modern cynic might say it's because this is where the Soviet Union used to test its nuclear armed torpedoes and swimming in here might make you glow in the dark. But the gentle lapping of the waves up against the shores must have been such a relaxing feeling for the traveller who had already crossed thousands of miles and is about to turn right and head to Kashgar in China and finally sell the products he's carrying and buy the new ones that he's carrying back. But imagine turning up here on a warm day like today with a blue sky and on the horizon, the mountains with the gentle snow that formed the night before. What a beautiful place to come. This is the Grigor Kriyevska Gorge in Kyrgyzstan. And you look at this stunning beauty and think those who would have walked up and down the Silk Road back in the, I don't know, 600s, 700s, 900s, 1200s, would have seen a view very similar to this if they had walked up this gorge a little bit, which I'm sure very few of them did, but too busy going to market. Glacial river, clean as you like, coming down this beautiful natural gorge. Took a bit of a hike to get here. Ah, oh, but well worth it. Lake Izzy Cool has a whole bunch of these great gullies and streams going up and down it that are astonishingly beautiful and run their way into the lake. Imagine for a moment what it would have been like 500, 1,000, 1,500 years ago walking from the dust of Persia towards Kashgar in China and coming across this. You'd really love to just take a dip in the stream and wash the dust off your face 
wipe the sweat off your brow. And this part of the Kyrgyz Republic, it must have been like that to people marching up and down the Silk Road because it is so breathtakingly beautiful. Lake Izikul isn't just the home to merchant traders on the Silk Route for that thousand years between the middle of the first millennium and middle, middle of the second after Christ. It goes back to prehistory. Here we have some petroglyphs dating back to around about the 6th to 3rd century BC, showing around this beautiful lake and all up and down the Silk Road, people had lived here for many thousands of years. Over my right shoulder is Barana Tau, which dates back to the 10th or 11th century. And on the hill next to it is the remains of Busagana Town, which was founded in the 10th century and destroyed by an earthquake about five centuries later. This was one of the caravanistas on the Great Silk Road. And here you can find examples of three great religions that fought their way up and down the Great Silk Road. Christians, Muslims, and the Buddhists all were flowing through this area in great trade that existed from the third century to around about the 14th century. That period of history that European education often forgets. And this is just one of many places along the Great Silk Road where you can see the interface of these great religions. This uh, Chinese looking temple is actually a mosque and that's a minaret because it was built by people from Western China who fled China, uh, persecuted for their religion and came to Kyrgyzstan to set up. It was built about oh, a century or so ago. It is another good example of the melange of religions in this part of the world where people persecuted by one may move across into another country. And you look at the design clues of this mosque, you can see its heritage dating back to old, almost Confucian temples. Like their Mongolian cousins, the Kyrgyz nomads would live in what the Mongolians call gares and what the Kyrgyz call yurts which is simply wool felt over a wooden frame. Very easy to put up and to dismantle and to travel with. Quite warm actually, and can, considering in Mongolia, you need to be able to live in these things down to minus 47 with a stove on the inside. For a nomadic family in a very cold climate, these things are quite, uh, quite practical really. and welcome to Bishkek, the capital of the Kyrgyz Republic. They used to call themselves Kyrgyzstan, but a couple of years ago they decided to get rid of the stand, so it's just the Kyrgyz Republic. Over my left shoulder here is Manus, one of the historical characters of the Kyrgyz history, and we'll talk about him a little bit further on. And I'm here in the main square of Bishkek, having a look at a beautiful square and lovely gardens recently cleaned up because of course we've just passed on August 21st the 25th anniversary of the Kyrgyz Republic's independence from the Soviet Union. Now this country was a stop on the Great Silk Road. Many people traded through here, religions came backwards and forwards through here and the history of this place will be really interesting as part of the narrative of the Silk Road. It had been controlled by the Chinese over years, it had been run by the Mongolians for years, and really, until the Soviet times, it still had the sense of the nomadic herders living in Geras, very similar to the Mongolian way of life. And now, they are stretching out to the world, reaching out to create an independent identity and a modern economy. And just looking around the streets here, you can say that they're feeling pretty good. But here is a challenge. 2017 is the parliamentary and, and presidential election. It will be, if it passes peacefully, the first time that there'll be a transition, a democratic transition from one president to another. Because every other time, uh, from 1991 onwards, they've had another revolution to overthrow a president. So let's hope they get that democracy right. So who was this guy Manus? And what did he do? 
Now he lived in the pre-Mongol times, they say somewhere between 800 and 1200, that's 400 years. He didn't live for 400 years. And indeed, it's not sure whether he's a real historical character or a narrative created in history or a combination of the two. Now, Kyrgyz has two words, Kyrgyz and Gis. Kyrgyz is 40 and Gis is female. So Kyrgyz literally is from 40 women, the 40 tribes of the Kyrgyz Republic. And most people can still determine which of those 40 tribes they come from. And what Manus is said to have done is united the 40 tribes to combine against the invading Chinese and the invading Mongols. That's what Manus is supposed to have done. So over my right shoulder here is a statue of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Now, the Kyrgyz got rid of the Soviet Union in 1991, 25 years ago. So why do they keep a statue of Lenin? Well, the former Soviet Union had a number of, a number of republics and each of those republics were a number of nationalities. And indeed here in Kyrgyzstan, you still need to list your nationality on your passport. Are you Kyrgyz, are you Uzbek, are you Tajik, etc. And there are a lot of former Soviet Republic nationalities that don't have countries. What Lenin did was he gave to the Kyrgyz people recognition of a country. So he gave them land. So they've taken his statue from the front square and put it behind the museum here in recognition that what Lenin did was give the Kyrgyz people land to go with their nationality. I'm walking through Osh Market. Osh Market was uh, built in the 1800s, but said to be on the site of one of the original Silk Road markets that ceased in the 1500s. And uh, this harks back to the tradition of Bishkek being on the old Silk Road. So they say the market here operated from about the year 800 to about the year 1500, ceased and went, then was rebuilt again about the uh, 1800s. Here on the highway from Bishkek to Lake Izikul is the turn off to Kashgar in China. And back in the days of the Silk Road, the turn off to, to Kashgar in China would more or less have been around about here. So this for thousands of years has been the place where travellers would come and turn right and do the last 400 kilometre stretch to Kashgar which was one of the main markets on the Chinese end of the Silk Road.